In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded. Questions without notice, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister advise the House how the government has responded to the allegation a woman was sexually assaulted in the Defence Minister's office in March 2019 has an appropriate duty of care for the woman been exercised? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My government takes all such matters, all matters of workplace safety, very, very seriously. Everyone should feel safe in their workplace, wherever that is. Reports today are deeply distressing. This matter is under consideration by police. At all times, Mr Speaker, guidance was sought from Ms Higgins as to how she wished to proceed and to support and respect her decisions. This important best practice principle of empowering Ms Higgins is something that the government has always sought to follow in relation to this matter. The government has aimed to provide Ms Higgins with her agency, to provide support to make decisions in her interests and to respect her privacy. This offer of support and assistance continues. It is important that Ms Higgins' views are listened to and respected, and I table for the purposes of the House a statement issued by a government spokesperson today on these matters. The member for Swan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister inform the House about the latest developments in the Morrison government's COVID-19 vaccination strategy and how the rollout of, rollout of safe, effective and free vaccines will underpin our continued recovery from the pandemic? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Swan for his question, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this is an historic day for Australia. As the Health Minister has just confirmed outside this place, I can confirm that Australia's first delivery of COVID-9 vaccines have arrived, Mr Speaker. Yeah. The vaccines have touched down in Australia, Mr Speaker. 142,000 doses uh, of the Pfizer vaccine have arrived in Sydney around midnight today. Free and equitable access to safe and vaccine, Ms. Members safe on my and left. effective COVID-9 vaccines is this government's policy, Mr. Speaker, and it is in delivery. Um, one of the largest logistic exercises ever undertaken in this country uh, has been planned for, Mr. Speaker, and is now underway. Mr. Speaker, we have been building this vaccine portfolio, <coughs> onshore manufacturing capability, the workforce, the cold chain logistics, the vaccination locations, working together with our medical experts, our state and territory governments around the country, Mr. Speaker, to ensure the effective implementation of this critically important program for our country. This program has been developed by medical experts and it has been approved by medical experts, Mr Speaker, so Australians can have confidence in the Australian vaccination strategy. Uh, the Therapeutic Goods Administration is final testing the Pfizer vaccine this week, and the government's total support across our vaccine program now amounts to some six and a half billion dollars with an initial allocation of around 1.9 billion dollars for the rollout of that, that vaccine. People who need to get the protection first will get that first, Mr Speaker. The most vulnerable in our community, those working in those critical areas, Mr Speaker, is where that vaccination strategy begins. But also I note that this is just the start of this process. I visited with the Health Minister last Friday in Melbourne, Mr Speaker, the CSL. Uh, installation where they are doing the final stages of the Australian production of the AstraZeneca vaccine, some 50 million doses. In August of last year, we took the decision not to leave ourselves vulnerable to international supply chains and to ensure that we had the Australian sovereign capability to actually produce these vaccines here in Australia. And we had the opportunity to thank those Australians who have been working around the clock, Mr Speaker, for many, many months at CSL to ensure that the domestic production of those vaccines is available right here in Australia to ensure the success of our vaccination strategy. This will play a key role in continuing to restore confidence, not just in the community, but in the building and growing confidence that exists in our economy as well. It has always been our objectives 
to both save lives and to save livelihoods. And the successful implementation, the development of that vaccination strategy is there to see. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister agree that two workers doing the same job at the same workplace should get the same pay? <coughs> The Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker, all of our policies seek to achieve the objectives of ensuring that Australians get into jobs and they get treated fairly in the workplace, Mr Speaker, and that they are treated safely in the workplace. And all of the industrial arrangements that sit around those matters, Mr Speaker, are appropriately in place to protect those workers. Mr Speaker, that is what our policies do. That is what the policies that are before the House and our legislation seek to do, and we would seek the support of the opposition to help us get more people into jobs. The member for Reid. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the minister please update the House on the Morrison government's response to COVID-19, including the vaccine rollout, and how this approach will ensure a stronger Australia and save lives? The Minister for Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for Reid, particularly for her work uh, as a health professional taking care of the emotional needs and the psychological needs of Australians before coming to this place. One of the important pieces of news today, uh, before we get to the vaccines, is that uh, I'm advised there are now no Australians in ICU for COVID-19 reasons anywhere. Now, these numbers, of course, may change over the course of the coming months. But as of this day, we've seen zero lives lost in 2021 due to COVID in Australia. But sadly, the world has reached approximately 2.4 million lives. We now have no Australians in uh, ICU or on ventilation due to COVID. And significantly, uh, uh, we have had only one case today in the community, <coughs> one case in Victoria, and none in seven out of eight states and territories. So a very important result nationwide. Another important thing to happen is, as the Prime Minister has set out, that, of course, the first shipment of vaccines has now arrived in Australia. 142,000 uh, doses of uh, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, of those which will now be taken by the TGA and they'll be assessed uh, to make sure that safety, quality no, uh, and uh, there is no damage, no breach of the integrity of them during the course of the transmission, that they've all been maintained. Subject to that, uh, we will then be in a position to ensure that uh, we have 62,000 doses provisioned for second doses and continuous supply, uh, and that we have 80,000 doses available uh, commencing on the 22nd of February, Monday of next week, around Australia, the vaccination program. That program will begin uh, with uh, the most vulnerable uh, combination of the border and quarantine workers, our frontline health workers and our aged care and disability residents and staff. Um, that's uh, about ensuring that uh, those that are either most at risk of contracting and transmitting uh, or those that are most at risk from the consequences of the illness are dealt with in that first phase. It's expected that first phase will take approximately six weeks. Subject to the Therapeutic Goods Administration uh, making a positive decision on the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, we are then expecting that uh, AstraZeneca uh, uh, international vaccines will add to that and double the number of weekly vaccines uh, in early March, uh, if not earlier. And then this will be uh, added to by the CSL production uh, coming out of their Parkville plant of a million doses a week from late March. And uh, I've been advised that that fill and finish process commenced today. So today's an important day. It's the next step in protecting Australians, in saving lives and protecting lives. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister now tell the House whether he agrees that two workers doing the same job at the same workplace should get the same pay? 
the Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, the, the opposition seeks to take a matter that is actually far more complicated than they suggest, because there are many other issues Members that go to what left. is happening in any one workplace. And what's it's important, Mr. Speaker, is that in that workplace, in that workplace, there should be the opportunities for Australians uh, to be able to get the hours they're looking for, to be able to extend their hours, to be able to earn more in their place of work. And the best way for them to achieve that is if they're working for businesses, Mr. Speaker, that are actually making profits and are actually going forward. In the absence of a growing economy, Mr. Speaker, in the absence of a growing economy, in the absence of a government policy that is actually encouraging businesses to get back in their feet, workers are worse off, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in, a, in, a, in an alternative policy setting that would see higher taxes under the Labor Party, the more regulation Prime under the will, Labor will Party, Mr. Speaker. His seat, the manager of opposition business on a point of order. On direct relevance, Mr. Speaker, it's a really tight question. It's the second time we've we've asked it in in this form, and the Prime Minister. You know, there's a whole lot of opportunities to do wide-ranging industrial relations answers, but this one's about same job, the same The manager pay. of opposition business will resume his seat. I'll make two points briefly. Uh, yes, it was a tight question, but it was one of those questions that's highlighted in practice that's sort of inviting a yes-no answer, which um, you can't compel the Prime Minister or Minister to give. So the Prime Minister was entitled um, to go over the territory. He went over until just very recently. He, uh, the question doesn't allow uh, uh, an examination of alternative policies, but the Prime Minister was in order until that point. Thank you, Mr. So the government will continue to ensure that businesses in this country pay lower taxes as our policies deliver, to continue to operate together with employees to ensure they have the best possible set of arrangements to ensure that Australians can get back into the work um, as a result of what we're doing post this COVID-19 recession, Mr Speaker, to get Australians back to work so they can earn more, so they can get more hours and they can support those enterprises to go forward with confidence. We're seeing confidence lift in our economy. We're seeing the comeback well underway, Mr Speaker. And under those policies, Australian workers are better off. The member for Kennedy. Rural initiative in the Fly River, half of New Guinea. Just as Member for Kennedy can pause, we're just not hearing through the microphone. Just make sure broadcasting. No, it's not, it's not a booby trap by me, I assure you. <laughs> Member for Kennedy, if he if he begins his question again, and we'll reset the clock. Forces at work. <laughs> no, well, you you're right to be suspicious. <laughs> Minister, can I start again? Home Affairs Minister. You're aware of China's Daru initiative in the Fly River, half of New Guinea. The Singapore Straits is controlled by Muslims, enraged by Chinese treatment of Uyghurs. In the alternative Torres Straits, four young Chinese men with curious backgrounds have opened a shop on Yam. Similarly, four Chinese are attempting to buy the tip of Cape York from traditional owners, two whitefellas from Sydney. Minister, not a single Australian believes these are commercial initiatives. What action, Minister? What action? The Minister for Home Affairs. Well, Mr Speaker, I uh, thank the Honourable Member for his question. Obviously, the Australian Government has an incredibly uh, important and valuable relationship with the Government of Papua New Guinea. Uh, the Prime Minister has a very close relationship with uh, Prime Minister Marape and all of us uh, work constantly to make sure that we are doing, as a country, a very important country in our region, all that we can for PNG. And we will work with PNG. I know that the Prime Minister has raised uh, this issue, which I, I think uh, is highly speculative, uh, if I might say so, to the member for Kennedy. I've seen the uh, press reporting around the Daru proposal, but highly, highly speculative. But only this week the Prime Minister has raised that with uh, Prime Minister uh, Marape, and we'll continue to work with our PNG counterparts. In terms of the Western Province, uh, we are putting a significant amount of support into that province, working with the Governor there and making sure that we can provide support uh, to that part of the world, and particularly at the moment uh, in relation to the response for COVID. Uh, the Foreign Affairs Minister and the Minister for Health uh, has had a particular focus on making sure we can have the vaccine rolled out uh, across the Pacific, uh, but in particular in PNG, we're working closely 
with our colleagues, and uh, I'll finish on this point, the government takes very seriously uh, any attempts to subvert uh, our sovereignty. We are putting more and more money each year into ASIO, uh, into ASIS, into our national security agencies to make sure that our equities are protected, and this government will always stand up for the interests of Australians. The member for Line. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for uh, Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Could the Deputy Prime Minister outline to the House how the transport industry will play a key role in the distribution of Australia's COVID-19 vaccine and how this will be critical to the Morrison and McCormack government in building a stronger Australia? The Deputy Prime Minister. Well, I do thank the member for line for his question, Mr Speaker, and acknowledge uh, his work as a health professional, not just in the past but ongoing, Mr Speaker, and his interest in these matters, and acknowledge the transport companies within his electorate of line and the fine job that they do, particularly for regional Australia. Mr Speaker, after a long 14 months of dealing with COVID-19 across the nation, we've now reached a point where we can start to vaccinate Australians. And we must remember, of course, and we sympathise with those 909 families across the nation at James Quan, it seems a long, long time ago, on March 1 in Perth last year, who lost his life, the first person to lose their life through COVID-19 in Australia. And we must mourn and we will continue to do so for all those families who've lost a loved one. But what we've done, what we've been able to achieve as a nation compared to other nations across the world has been quite remarkable. And we, I thank all Australians for the efforts that they've gone to, for complying with the best possible medical advice, for wearing masks when asked to do so, for social distancing, for quarantining, for doing all of those things that have been, yes, very difficult on their lives and livelihoods. I thank them very much. I know we all do as members of this House and this Parliament. The commencement of, of administering the COVID vaccine will be a historic day as we begin to look for a future beyond COVID, a, some sort of normality beyond this global pandemic. And the Australian government is placing great stock in making sure that we've got the right strategy when it comes to the vaccine rollout. And the rollout of the vaccine across Australia is going to be one of the largest logistical tasks ever undertaken by this nation. And just yesterday, I was in Western Sydney with the uh, member for Parks, the Minister for Regional Health, uh, as well as the CEO of DHL Supply Chain, Saul Resnick. And we were looking at the procedures and the protocols that they have in place for this large logistical exercise. We were looking at the coal stores. We were talking about how the vaccine will be rolled out across Australia. It's a big country, and this is a massive task, but we will absolutely get it done. And the important thing is that rural and regional Australia will not get left behind. They will get the vaccine just like people in metropolitan Australia will, and, and certainly uh, they will be. They will be served and able to get that jab just as soon as anybody in metropolitan Australia is. And the government is working with both DHL and Linfox to ensure cold chain and supply to all Australians, including, as I say, every far-flung nook and cranny of this nation. Mr Speaker, the government is working with state and territory governments, with uh, primary health networks, general practices, Aboriginal community controlled health services and general practitioner-led respiratory clinics. And I know the role that the Minister for Health and the Minister for Regional Health have played in this exercise to ensure appropriate coverage across all of Australia. So important, and I urge and encourage Australians to get that jab to help their own health and help their economic recovery. The Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer to the working conditions of Queensland coal miners Simon and Ron. They work in the Bowen Basin in the same job with the same boss, side by side on the same roster. Simon is a permanent employee, but Ron is employed by a labour hire company, is paid 20 per cent less and has none of the worker entitlements that Simon has. Can the Prime Minister advise the House how this is fair? The Members on both sides, the Leader of the House and Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I mean, it's a it's a serious question, and it goes to the issue of it goes to the issue of the use of labour hire. And the earlier formulation of the question was whether or not it was agreed that two workers doing the same job at the same place 
in the same workplace should get the same pay. That is not even the Labor policy. When you read their speech, they say that a Labor hire firm who employs someone at the same job at the same pay should get no less. It's actually not even their policy. And they have had some difficulties in working out what their own policy is. And the difficulties, of course, on arise left. with Labor Hire for the benefit of the House. That the ABS notes that Labor Hire, as a proportion of all employees, has been stable at about 2 per cent over the last decade. What is very important and what the government absolutely ensures occurs is that under labour hire agreements that people should have exactly the same rights as other employees, including of course, unfair dismissal rights, award entitlements, bargaining rights, general protections and work health and safety protections, to name but a few. The Labor Party say that they have a policy for perfect equality between those two forms of employment, but when you actually read their policy they acknowledge that that is incredibly difficult and indeed in their policy say that someone at the Labor hire with the same position as the same type of work at the same place should get at least as much but could get more. Not exact parity as they pretended in their earlier question. And the reason why, Mr Speaker, that is actually very, very difficult to achieve in practice is what if, for instance, an employee uh, Member for who is remunerated directly the in Leader of the House will resume his seat. Members will cease interjecting. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker, it was a very specific question. Is this a question on, rele yes, on relevance? Yes, Speaker. Yeah. It was a very specific question about real workers in the Bowen Basin and their real conditions they enjoy right now. Their photo, their photo is available. The Simon and Ron, the and you need to address it. Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Members on my right will cease interjecting. Member for Dawson is now warned. <laughs> Members on both sides. The question certainly had a long preamble, and I gave a lot of latitude to the Leader of the Opposition. The Leader of the House uh, has been relevant, I think, up until about this point, where the question didn't ask about any alternative policies. It asked about uh, the government's approach, and I'd asked him to just come back to the to the to the question. Well, uh, the leader of the opposition pretends that some perfect parity between two workers, one in labour hire and one directly remunerated, is an easy thing to do. But they can't tell us how that would be done. And indeed, the Leader of the Opposition can't even get exact parity in two versions of his own speech inside 24 hours. But he's going to try and pretend to these two the, workers the that he can leader, sort that out, the leader of the House, notwithstanding having no plan to do it. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. Member for Kingsford Smith. Other members, I remind you of the provisions of 94A. They don't always well, don't require a warning. I'm not going to keep interrupting proceedings for members who continually interject. Many of you have your names in Hansard many, many times. The member for Herbert. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer please update the House on the success of the Morrison government's JobKeeper program and how it proved to be such a valuable lifeline for jobs and businesses while Australia endured the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Treasurer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I acknowledge the distinguished service in the Australian Defence Force of the member for Herbert, Mr Speaker, and his support, like others on this side of the House, for policies that have delivered tax cuts to more than 70,000 people in the electorate of Herbert. Now, Mr Speaker, the Australian labour market is undergoing a remarkable recovery. The unemployment rate fell to 6.6 per cent in December. 320,000 jobs have been created in the last three months. 90 per cent of the 1.3 million Australian workers who either lost their jobs or saw their working hours reduced to zero at the start of the pandemic are now back at work. The participation rate is at a record high of 66.2 per cent. And last week, we saw the Reserve Bank upgrade its 
employment forecasts and its rate of unemployment, which will see the rate of unemployment fall to 6 per cent this year and to 5.25 per cent by mid-2023. On the RBA forecast, Mr Speaker, the unemployment rate is recovering three times faster in the COVID recession than it did in the 1990s recession, Mr Speaker. And we're seeing across the rest of the economy strong numbers. Strong numbers in the housing market, Mr Speaker. Strong numbers in terms of automo automotive sales and strong numbers in terms of business and consumer confidence coming back. But also today we have got new data from the ATO about the JobKeeper program in the December quarter. And it shows that 2.1 million Australians have graduated off JobKeeper, Mr Speaker. 520,000 Australian businesses have graduated off JobKeeper, Mr Speaker. Across Western Australia, a 70 per cent fall in the December quarter from job, of JobKeeper recipients. Across South Australia, a 67 per cent fall. In Tasmania, a 65 per cent fall. In Queensland, a 64 per cent fall. Indeed, in Townsville, a 72 per cent fall, Mr Speaker. Across New South Wales, a 6 per 60 per cent fall, and unfortunately in Victoria, which has experienced the second wave, just a 44 per cent fall. But what these numbers show, Mr Speaker, is across the economy, in every state and territory, across all regions and across all sectors, we are seeing thousands and thousands of our fellow Australians graduate off JobKeeper. There is still a long way to go. There is still a long way to go. Australians are doing it tough still, and across many regions they are doing it tough, and in many sectors they are doing it tough. But JobKeeper has been a remarkable program. It's, it's been an economic lifeline for millions of Australians and played an important role in the strengthening of the labour market, which we're seeing right now to this very day. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industrial Relations. The minister says that paying at least the minimum wage to every worker is complicated. Yeah. What exactly is complicated about workers being paid at least the minimum wage? The Leader of the House and Minister for Industrial Relations. Minimum wage applies. There should never be any excuse, and it's unlawful, to not pay the minimum wage. And that is a very well-known principle. Uh, if, if the member is asking questions about people to whom the minimum wage doesn't apply, then I'm sure he'd be able to clarify that in a further question. The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer remind the House of the wide range of economic supports the Morrison government is providing to create a stronger Australia as we continue to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Treasurer. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Boothby for a question, acknowledge her experience as a journalist before coming to this place and working for the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and her support for policies that have led to tax cuts for 77,000 people across the electorate of Boothby, Mr Speaker. Now, the Australian economy begins 2021 from a position where it is strengthening, Mr Speaker. We're seeing an economic recovery that is underway, Mr Speaker. Now, the International Monetary Fund has forecast that the economy of Spain is going to contract by around 11 per cent, that the economy of the United Kingdom will contract by around 10 per cent, that the economy of France and Italy by around 9 per cent, that the economies of Germany, Canada and Japan by more than 5 per cent. The economy of the United States by 3.4 per cent, but their forecast for Australia for its contraction in 2020 is less than 3 per cent, Mr Speaker. And this is why, based on the economic and the health position we are in today, you wouldn't want to be in any other country but Australia. And a key part of that economic recovery that we have seen is the commitment by the Morrison government to $251 billion of economic support. $148 billion of support, which is already out the door, Mr. Speaker, including $83 billion for JobKeeper, out the door, Mr. Speaker. Cash flow boost, $35 billion, out the door, Mr. Speaker. The JobSeeker coronavirus supplement, $19 billion, out the door already, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes to $750 payments, two of them, and a further $250 payment, 
to millions of pensioners and carers and veterans and others on income support around $10 billion out the door. So, Mr Speaker, those programs have been critical as an economic lifeline for the Australian community. But on top of that, we have put in place the Home Builder program. More than 80,000 applications, and the Master Builders Association has said it's helped save thousands of jobs. We have put in place 340,000 training places. Mr. Speaker, we have brought forward billions of dollars of infrastructure uh, programs. Mr. Speaker, and when it comes to tax cuts, we believe in allowing Australians to keep more of their hard-earned money. And there's more than a billion dollars a month that will be flowing through to the pockets of hard-working Australian families through our tax cuts. The combination, the combination of these programs, as well as the COVID support that we put in place at the height of the pandemic, is seeing an economic recovery that is underway. An economic recovery that has seen 90 per cent of the 1.3 million Australians who either lost their jobs or saw their working hours reduced to zero at the start of the pandemic, now back at work. There's a long way to go, but the Australian economy is recovering. Yeah. The Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Industrial Relations. Could the Minister outline to the House which workers the government believes should be paid less than the minimum wage? Yeah. Members on my right, the Leader of the House and Minister for Industrial Relations. Well, Mr Speaker, it was this government who ensured that the laws that require that people be properly characterised in their employment are as strong and well enforced as is possible and has ever been the case. So the coalition made it unlawful to misrepresent an employment relationship by treating someone as a contractor rather than as an employee. And in the 2019-20 budget, we took further action in that space, action that was never taken by members opposite, by providing $9.2 million in additional funding to the Fair Work Ombudsman to establish a dedicated unit to crack down on sham contracting. People should be properly classified in their employment, and where they are subject to minimum wages, that wage must be paid. And indeed, part of the legislation before the House is to ensure for the first time criminal penalties would apply to wage theft and members opposite will vote against that. For the first time ever, there will be sufficiently strong penalties to ensure that people are not underpaid, including a quantum of benefits obtained, which means that the financial penalty will actually, for the first time ever, provide a disincentive to underpayment, and members opposite want to vote against that measure. For the first time ever, people who are in casual employment will have a strong, secure, consistent pathway to move from casual employment to permanent employment, and members opposite want to vote against that as well. The member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Will the Minister please outline to the House how the Morrison government is backing innovative businesses to commercialise new products as we continue to recover from the COVID pandemic? And how does this government how does this support our government's plan to build a stronger Australia? The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. Our government understands that science and technology are key enablers of industry growth, and that is particularly important through new technologies that are going to give our industry a cutting edge on the global stage that will boost competitiveness, that will create jobs, that will take our economy forward. And that's why we've made a record investment in innovation, science and research in the budget. And that's why, Mr Speaker, our $1.5 billion modern manufacturing strategy focuses on harnessing science and research collaboration to deliver the real practical results that we as a government are very focused on delivering. Now, Mr Speaker, our government has always backed innovative businesses by getting the economic conditions right, as well as through a range of very practical support programs. For example, our Accelerating Commercialisation Program, which has a tremendous track record of helping Australian entrepreneurs take their products to the world. And there's a whole range of different products that we have supported as a government. It includes a nasal spray that can help 
treat dementia. It includes self-driving smart wheels that can be clipped onto manual wheelchairs. It includes long-life uh, milk or fresh milk that can be made to uh, remain on the shelves for up to 60 days. And just yesterday, Mr Speaker, I was delighted to announce a further $4.2 million in matched funding in the latest round of the Accelerating Commercialisation Grants. Now, this includes $1 million for agricultural science company Seaforest. Now, Seaforest will use that funding to increase supplies of their seaweed additive for livestock feed. Now, this reduces livestock methane emissions and it improves herd health. So it is a win for the environment and it is a big win for our farmers. Now, over the last five years, Seaforest has worked very closely with the CSIRO to test and to refine its product. And, Mr Speaker, this is exactly what the Morrison government is all about, doing all that we can to facilitate industry and researcher engagement, because as we harness that, we know that our businesses will be able to grow. And as a government, we are very committed to making sure that our small businesses grow into medium enterprises and medium enterprises grow into large businesses. So, Mr Speaker, one of the ways that we're going to, to do that is by harnessing the technology and making sure that we are using technology and not taxes. The member for Chifley. Yeah. Thanks, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, food delivery rider Rosia suffered a concussion and arm injury in a road accident while on the job. She says she had to return to work before she was ready because she had, quote, no other choice and was then sacked because she couldn't ride fast enough due to her injuries. Shame. What's complicated about workers who are injured on the job having time to recover before returning to work? Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister has the call. I'll ask the Minister for Industrial Relations to add to this, Mr Speaker. But that is why in the changes that we're bringing forward into this place, we are creating the pathway from, from non-permanent work, casual work and other forms of work, into permanent employment, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this Mem is, why, members on this my is why we're seeking to do exactly that. If someone is in a temporary form of employment, Mr Speaker, in a casual form of employment, then, Mr Speaker, the he's answering the question. There may be no reference to the type of the, the Prime employment Minister contract, resume his seat. The, man, the member for Kingston, the manager of opposition business, on a point of order. Yeah, just on direct relevance, which um, might assist with the answer as well. The person concerned, as described at the start of the question, is not employed as a casual. They're, they're engaged as a gig worker, and so therefore the relevance of the bill that the prime minister is referring to doesn't help this person at all. The manager has completed his point of order. The L Prime Minister? Prime Minister has the call. Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker. The question made no mention of the nature of the employment contract that the individual was involved in. What our government is seeking to do is to get people back into jobs, Mr Speaker. That's what we're seeking to do. We're, we're seeking to get people onto higher rates of pay by ensuring that they're not locked into award wages, but they have the opportunity to get into enterprise agreements where the, where the experience clearly shows that they have the opportunity to earn more. We want people to be able to get additional hours and additional shifts and ensure that the things that are preventing that are removed, Mr Speaker. That's what we're seeking to do. What those opposite are seeking to do is to stop us from doing that. Now, Mr Speaker, the, the, the issue that is highlighted by the member is of course concerning. It is very concerning, Mr Speaker, and we want to provide more opportunities uh, for the type of employment that provides that security. And I know, Mr Speaker, I am aware of no other alternative that has been put forward by any other member of this place that would address the situation that has been highlighted the member, including the policy outlined by the Leader of the Opposition, which does not achieve the outcome that the member has referred to. The member for Moncrief. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, City and the Arts. 
Will the minister update the House on how the Morrison government's handling of the pandemic, combined with its location incentive program, have brought world-renowned screen productions to Australia, which is creating jobs and ensuring a stronger Australia? The Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts. Well, I do thank the member for Moncrief, who, of course, is a former professional musician, one of the many uh, diverse backgrounds on this side of the house, and she's therefore very familiar with the glamour of show business, Mr. Speaker, but also the sheer amount of hard work that's involved. And I'm pleased to say we've had our fair share of the glamour of show business in recent months, with some of the world's leading directors and actors coming to Australia. Now, Mr Speaker, I had the privilege of visiting the set of 13 Lives on the Gold Coast last week, and I spoke with director Ron Howard, who told me why their movie is filming in Australia. It's because of our skilled and talented actors and crew. It's because of the great locations that Australia has. It's certainly because of Australia's careful management of the COVID risks, which has been noticed around the world, and of course it's because of the direct support provided under the Morrison government's $400 million location incentive program. And so, uh, Mr. Speaker, as well as 13 Lives, we've got NBC Universal, which is filming Young Rock featuring Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And if, like me, you have a 12-year-old son, you're very familiar with his oeuvre. Uh, Joe Exotic and Irreverent, also being filmed in Queensland. In Melbourne, Black Light with Liam Neeson, and also Canberra got into the act too. Escape from Spiderhead, being filmed for Netflix on the Gold Coast. The Tourist in South Australia. Thor Love and Thunder in Sydney. Mr Speaker, it's a cornucopia of global productions. But it's more than glamour, Mr Speaker, because it's jobs. It's jobs. 19 productions attracted so far under our location incentive program, with total production budgets of almost $1.5 billion. That's over 11,800 jobs. For all of those skilled Australian crew and cast that Ron Howard talked about, all of the downstream businesses that are supplying services, catering, props, all kinds of services to these productions, it builds on our support for the Australian film sector, our $50 million temporary interruption fund, with 37 productions approved for coverage under that, the extra $53 million we allocated in last year's budget for Screen Australia and Australian Children's Television Foundation. Our location incentive program, Mr Speaker, is succeeding in bringing global productions to Australia. We're building scale. We're creating jobs for our Australian screen production sector. <laughs> the member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Was the decision by the Minister for Home Affairs to provide the National Retail Association an $880,000 grant from the proceeds of crime after they had donated to his election campaign consistent with the Prime Minister's ministerial standards? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, I thank the member for his question. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, on this matter, decisions relating to funding of local projects to improve community safety under the Safer Communities Funds were made consistent with the relevant rules and guidelines, Mr Speaker. They were, Mr Speaker. They were made consistent with those matters, and, uh, and I think that, that settles the issue, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister has concluded his answer. The member for Nichols. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management. Will the Minister outline to the House how the Morrison McCormack government's trade pillar of the Ag 2030 plan is working to expand international markets for Australian farmers and facilitating more efficient export processes? And how will this plan work to ensure a stronger Australia? The Minister for Agriculture. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Nichols for his question. I acknowledge the agricultural powerhouse that is the Nichols electorate and the significant contribution it makes towards our $65 billion agricultural industry. 
and he'll play a significant part in agriculture reaching its $100 billion plan of, of an industry by 2030. And that's why in the budget the government announced our Ag 2030 plan, a seven-pillar plan to support agriculture in achieving their goal. And one of those key pillars is trade. You've got to understand that we're a nation of 25 million people. We produce enough food for 75 million. So if we don't engage the world, if we don't trade with the world, then we don't need the number of farmers that we've got, and we don't need the communities like Shepparton that are there to support them. And that's why we're built, building on the free trade agreements that we put in place with China, Korea, Japan, uh, Peru, Indonesia, the TPP-11, which those opposite said we were wasting our time on. Well, I'm proud to say, because of the investment of our budget in putting agricultural councils on the ground, these are the men and women that get rid of the technical barriers in country at government to government levels. We're for the first time sending a shipment of barley to Mexico, going into their beer, because we've been able to support our producers to be able to diversify. We're also sending 730,000 tonnes of barley, feed barley, into Saudi Arabia. That's an extra $230 million to the Australian economy diversifying our economic base, giving our farmers the opportunity to send boats left and right to be able to diversify into new markets. But we're also working in making sure that those agricultural councillors are expanded. Last budget, we went from 16 to 22, and in fact, we put our first one in Mexico, in Mexico City, to, to address Latin America. And now, as part of further measures, we're, we're having a surge of five additional agricultural councillors. Uh, that will look at new markets, working with industries to ensure uh, that we can open up market access, get rid of the technical barriers that allow our exporters to diversify, continue to diversify. But we're also looking at what we're doing and how we as a government are in their lives and how we can get out of it as quickly as we can while maintaining the regulatory barriers that make sure that we protect Brand Australia. And we're doing that by cutting red tape, working with industry to ensure that there's practical technological ways in which we can help them not only apply for export permits, but make sure that they are keeping up the regulatory framework that we would expect in protecting our brand. Our technology framework is also looking at making sure we get rid of over 200,000 export permits a year issued manually, doing it digitally. Also making sure that those that want to export are cutting down the number of application forms from around 20 down to one. That's just common sense. So what we're doing is putting the environment around our exporters, around our agricultural sector, because if we trade with the world, then I can tell you that Australian agriculture will meet its $100 billion target by 2030. The member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware that the $880,000 grant to the National Retail Association was a completely one-off separate grant from the Safer Communities Program and the Minister for Home Affairs instructed his department to design that grant program for the National Retail Association at the same time as the NRA made an sorry, a $6,500 grant, uh, donation to the Minister for Home Affairs. Just before the Prime Minister answers um, that question, um, the last part of the question is out of order and will need to be rephrased. Um, what is implying is an improper motive that the said association gave money directly to the minister. I'll allow you to rephrase. The Thank question. you, Mr. Speaker. Is the Prime Minister aware that the $880,000 grant to the National Retail Association was a completely different program to the Safer Communities Fund, and the Minister for Home Affairs instructed his department to design it purely to provide a grant? to the National Retail Association. The Prime Minister. Has Mr been. Speaker, I advise the guidelines have been followed in relation to all of these matters, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the government has been focused on ensuring our communities are safer. That's what these programs do, Mr Speaker. I, I was, on my I was up around the, Minister for, the member for Shortland's electorate just the other week, Mr Speaker. I suggest the member for Shortland spend a bit more time focusing on his constituents, Mr Speaker, and their jobs, Mr Speaker, who he is acting against the interests of in this place, Mr Speaker, rather than coming here and throwing muck around. The member for Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my on both question sides. Is the, the member for Ford has the call. <laughs> my question is to the Minister for Housing and the Assistant Treasurer. Will the Minister please update the House on how the Morrison government's Home Builder Grant 
is creating and supporting jobs in the construction sector, including my electorate of Ford, while helping build a stronger Australia in 2021. The Minister for Housing and Assistant Treasurer. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank uh, the member for Ford for his question? Like so many on this side of the house, the member for Ford is so focused on the jobs of those in the residential construction industry, the tradies, the carpenters, the bricklayers, and many. And I had the great honour last week of, in fact, meeting a number of workers in the member for Ford's electorate who are benefiting from the Home Builder Program. The Home Builder Program has ignited the residential construction industry, not just in Ford, not just in Queensland, but throughout our country, in every major city, in every regional area, in every small town. The residential construction industry has been absolutely set alight by the Home Builder Program. What we have seen, Treasury estimates, $18 billion of direct construction activity as a result of Home Builder, with $60 billion of broader economic activity being driven by the Home Builder Program. $60 billion of economic activity that the Labor Party opposed. Now, in Queensland, in the member for Ford's home state, we've seen uh, 18,000 applications, 18,000 projects. And part of the reason we have seen up to a million jobs in the residential construction industry supported by the Home Builder Program was brought home to me and the member for Ford when we visited the Stoddart Group in the member for Ford's electorate just last week. The Stoddart Group, which makes steel frames for homes, has now gone to three, uh, three shifts, three eight-hour shifts. And importantly, not only are we keeping their workforce uh, gainfully employed through the Home Builder Corrupt Program, they have put on 40 new staff. 40 new staff on the floor that the member for Ford and I were able to see and speak to. 40 people with fantastic jobs at the Stoddart Group because of that. Now, in addition to that, uh, the Stoddart Group also informed me that due to the instant asset write-off, and they wanted to thank the Treasurer, they'd invested in six new role-forming machines at $1.5 million. So there you see the Home Builder Program igniting demand in the residential construction industry and taking advantage of other incentives being put in place uh, by the government. Now, Mr Speaker, not only are we supporting the million jobs in the residential construction industry, which is so important and the primary driver of home build, but we are also supporting first home buyers. And home ownership and first home buyers are so important to the members of the coalition. In fact, we've seen first home buyer levels at their highest for over 10 years. We've seen new home sales up by 32.5 per cent. And as I always say, new home sales, sales means more jobs, means more economic activity, and that is what will partly fuel our recovery this year. The member for Lyons. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Why did the Minister announce two Safer Communities Fund grants during the Braddon by-election before grant guidelines were written before grant applications were written and before his, before his department had provided him with advice, which was that the projects were both unsuitable and ineligible. The Minister for Home Affairs. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. I want to quote the uh, Waratah Wynyard Mayor, Robbie Walsh, who said in regard to the funding for the CCTV cameras, I quote, uh, I think it's a great positive move that will assist with both Somerset and Wynyard in curtailing vandalism and detecting incidents. So, Mr Speaker, why have we provided funding to local communities? Because we Members want to keep people left. safe, Mr Speaker. We want to keep people safe. The decisions that have been pause. made in the relation to will, uh, will these pause. grants. Have been Minister, we'll just pause for a second. The member for Bruce will leave under 94A. The as the minister, minister's concluded his answer. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she's just going to the microphone. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Minister for Defence Industry. 
Well, the Minister outlined to the House how the Morrison government's record investment in Australia's defence industry is helping to create jobs and ensure a stronger Australia as we continue our recovery from the COVID-19 recession. The Minister for Defence Industry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the member for Robertson for her question and thank her and acknowledge her great support for the defence industries in New South Wales um, and more broadly across Australia. Mr Speaker, the Morrison government is investing $270 billion in our defence capability and our record investment is helping us to drive our economic recovery from the COVID-19 yeah, yeah. recession. Our investment is creating and supporting thousands of Australian jobs right across our great land. And just last week, Mr Speaker, I had the great pleasure, together with the Prime Minister and some of our other colleagues, um, of visiting the Hunter region, where we announced that our first F-35 aircraft had been inducted into BAE Systems Australia's maintenance depot. Mr Speaker, this is part of the next milestone of the F-35 program, and indeed it was a very exciting and very uplifting day. Mr Speaker, this depot will be a regional hub, a maintenance hub, sustainment hub and also an upgrade hub for the F-35 aircraft in the Asia-Pacific regions. Mr Speaker, hundreds of F-35 aircraft will flow through those doors of BAE in Newcastle in the decades ahead. Mr Speaker, this investment and this new uh, maintenance hub is all about protecting and securing Australia's interests, but it is much more than that, Mr Speaker. It's also about creating generations of jobs and driving investment in the Hunter region and across the, this wide brown land. Mr Speaker, this induction demonstrates to the world the leading capability of our local defence industry in Australia. And let me tell you, Mr Speaker, this is something that we all should be incredibly proud of. And I, I, think, I think the Prime Minister said it best the other day when he said everyone involved with the F-35 program is a top gun. And our government wants to give as many Australian companies Members on both opportunities sides. in the F-35 program. Member for Patterson. And we're already doing that, Mr Speaker, because we have some 50 Australian companies involved in the F-35 program working on contracts in excess of $2.7 billion. And there are other the member for Australian Patterson companies will leave like, under like Mirand, this manufacturing no, no, the, just the vertical. minister will pause. Can I people saying, come on, I've, I've asked her to cease interjecting, and she even interjected back <laughs> at me to say why she was interjecting. I mean, it's, it's, it's... The minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's a great pleasure to be able to talk about the companies that are already involved in the F-35 program, and there will be more to come now that we have this Asia-Pacific regional hub. Companies like Morand in Melbourne, who are manufacturing the vertical tails, companies like Queanbeyan based Lintec, who produce the circuit boards and the only company in Australia to do so, and Brisbane based TAE Aerospace, who is maintaining the F 35 engines. And a real feather in the cap for TAE, as I said, Brisbane based TAE Aerospace, um, as the work that they're performing on F 35 is the first time that this has been done outside of the US. So it's great news for them, and it's just a great example of the Australian capability. The member for Shortland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Why did the minister reject merit-based recommendations from his own community safety experts for the Safer Communities Fund and redirect funding to government-held and marginal seats? What's the point of having community safety experts if the minister just ignores them? The Minister for Home Affairs. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank uh, the honourable member for his question. Uh, under this program, the Safer Communities Program, we've committed over $180 million to local councils, uh, places of worship, not-for-profit organisations, organisations working with at-risk uh, young people, leading to greater community reliance uh, and, well, and sorry, resilience and wellbeing. Mr Speaker, the split between coalition and Labor seats under that program, and wait for this startling number, is 51.45 per cent to coalition and 48.55 per cent to Labor seats. Now, Mr Speaker, you would expect there to be a variation in the number because we have more seats. We have more seats in this place 
than you do. And, Mr. Speaker, when you ask what is this issue about, why are they throwing mud, I've been in this place long enough to watch a Labor leader under pressure. When they're under pressure, they look to distract, Mr. Speaker. They throw mud and they look to distract. You are in your dying days, brother. The member for Dawson. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia. Can the Minister inform the House how the Morrison McCormick government is supporting investment in the Australian resources sector and resources project, including coal mining, which supports jobs in regional Australia? Can the Minister advise of any alternative approaches? The Minister for Resources. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the member for Dawson for an excellent question. Uh, the member comes from one of the outstanding resources sector in central Queensland. Around Dawson, there is an enormous amount of jobs in the resources sector, and the member for Dawson member for stands Griffith. up for jobs. He stands up for the coal sector. He stands up for critical minerals. He stands up for gas, and he wants the people he represents to actually have a job into the future. Now, Mr. Speaker. In Queensland, there are some 78,000 individuals directly, directly employed from the resources sector. There has been 17.9 per cent in growth over the year, and in Queensland, coal jobs are up 22.8 per cent to 62,000. 22.8 per cent increase. And I note the questions earlier in question time, Mr. Speaker. I'm pretty sure the Leader of the Opposition didn't even meet any of those individuals in Moranbar. He didn't take the time to get there and head up to central Queensland to get into a coal mine to see exactly what's happening on the ground. But, Mr. Speaker, whether you're in Bulga, whether you're in Dawson, whether you're working at Cannington, we are supporting those individuals who are out there working hard. We are the ones out there supporting their industry. We are the ones who continue to put money on the table to ensure there are opportunities into the future. Now, Mr. Speaker, we've put $225 million into exploring for the future, 125 most recently, and exploring for the future will ensure that as we move forward there are opportunities for additional exploration, that we can identify more resources, that we can find more jobs, that we can open up places like the Beedaloo Basin. Now, Mr. Speaker, we have put out a strategic basin plan for the Beedaloo Basin in the Northern Territory. Hottest play on the planet. Over $200 million committed from us already. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that includes infrastructure like roads. Uh, that includes putting forward $50 million to ensure that exploration occurs earlier, not later, so we can get this gas into our systems as soon as we possibly can. So, Mr. Speaker, there are opportunities for the resources sector. There are opportunities for more jobs in our sector. There are opportunities for us to continue growth, continue to contribute to the Australian economy. But I'm asked about alternatives, Mr. Speaker, and if there are any alternatives. Well, Member for we know Isaacs. That those opposite, they're having to go each way, Mr. Speaker. They are having to go each way. But that has become no way. They are not supporting offshore oil and gas. They are not supporting gas. They are not supporting coal. They are not supporting those hard-working men and women who are out there in the resources sector every single day putting money into our economy, putting royalties into the bank, ensuring the essential services that Australian relies on, the Australians rely on, can be paid for. Mr Speaker, there are opportunities into the future. We will ensure they are developed. We will ensure that people have a job. We will ensure that in the member for Dawson's electorate there are even more opportunities than there are right now. The member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move the following motion that the House one notes that the Minister for Home Affairs cut funding to projects recommended by community safety experts in his department to fund projects in marginal and government-held electorates. B, the Minister for Home Affairs announced funding for two projects during the Braddon by-election before grant guidelines were finalised, before grant applications were written and before his department had provided him with advice, which was that the projects were unsuitable and ineligible. C, the Minister for Home Affairs also gave $880,000 from the proceeds of crime to the National Retail Association after it made a donation to support the Minister's election campaign. And D, this is just the latest scandal involving the government's rorting taxpayers' money to advance its political interests and two, therefore calls on the Minister for Home Affairs to immediately explain his actions to the House for a period not exceeding 15 minutes. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted. Mr. The member for Shortland. Speaker, 
I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent the member for Shortland from moving the following in motion immediately, that the House notes the Minister for Home Affairs cut funding to projects recommended by community safety experts in his department to fund projects in marginal and government-held electorates. B. The Minister for Home Affairs announced funding for two projects during the Braddon by-election before grant guidelines were finalised, before grant applications were written and before his department had provided him with advice which was the projects were unsuitable and ineligible. C. The Minister for Home Affairs also gave $880,000 from the proceeds of crime to the National Retail Association after it made a donation to support the minister's election campaign. And D, this is just the latest scandal involving the government rorting taxpayers' money to advance its political interests and to therefore calls on the Minister for Home Affairs to immediately explain his actions to the House for a period not exceeding 15 minutes. This minister is trading votes for making the community the less safe. Member for he doesn't care about seat the, the leader of the house. Speaker, I move that the member no longer be heard. The leader of the house has moved the member be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. <coughs> Question is the member for Shortland be no further heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Gray and Nichols tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Wirra and MacArthur tell us for the noes. <coughs> Order. The result of the division is I 63, noes 58. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy uh, Manager of Opposition Business. Seconded. They've learned nothing from sports rorts, thinking every government program is a Liberal Party slush fund. The Deputy Manager will resume his seat. The Leader of the House. I move that the member be no further heard. The question is the member be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the Deputy Manager of Opposition Business be no further heard. I appoint the same tellers as the previous division. Members must remain in their seats unless they're changing their vote or did not vote in the last division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Order. The result of the division is ayes 63, noes 58. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question is that the motion be disagreed to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. They take public money and they spend it on their own jobs. The Spreadsheets Deputy based the on the marginality. The leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I move that the question be put. The question is that the question be put. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lockdowns. Question is the question be put. I appoint the same tellers as the previous division. Again, in the successive division, members must remain in their seats unless they're changing their vote or did not vote in the last division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Order the result of the division is I 63, no's 58. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion moved by the member for Shortland be disagreed to. Uh, all those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Locked the doors. Question is the motion be disagreed to. I appoint the same tellers as the previous division. And again, in this successive division, members must remain in their seats unless they're changing their vote or did not vote in the last division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Order the result of the division is ayes 66, noes 55. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. No, no, the call goes to the other side. Yeah. The member for Braddon has the call. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Indigenous Australians. Will the minister please outline the importance of the national apology to the stolen generations and update the House on how the Morrison government's commitment to working and working in partnership with Indigenous Australians? The Minister for Indigenous Australians. Yeah. Can I thank the member for Braddon for your question? It's a good question because I heard you this morning deliver a speech in this chamber and I saw the very affectionate and warm response from Dr Emma Lee, who is an Indigenous anthropologist, and she appreciated the fact that you acknowledge the history of the past. The member for Barton, when you were reading this morning that extract out of the Bringing Them Home report, what it made me do was reflect on what are we doing for young people? Because your point's very strong in terms of cultural identity and the girls academies we've increased the number of places from 9000 uh, sorry from 2900 by an additional 2700 that allows young women to come together within those academies to look at their academic pathways but at the same time share cultural strength and identity we do the same for the Clontarf boys and those programs underpin that ongoing credentialing into adulthood by the support of nature that exists within them. In addition to that, it is about building hope. 
and building an opportunity for them to go on to other places in their lives that they aspire to, and I've been to many of them. But Closing the Gap, this time around, has a target on out-of-home care, which will really test every system on the placement of Indigenous children taken to out-of-home care programs. Family violence, they're all key initiatives within Closing the Gap, but we are doing it on a co-designed basis. When the PM first said to me, you'll work with 50 organisations, I frowned at him and said, you're asking me to do an incredible challenge if you know the politics of our community. That's hard work. But by co-designing, we now have ownership between the Commonwealth, state and territory governments and Indigenous Australians. And so it all goes well for the future working with SNAKE to develop an early childhood strategy, which I negotiated early days with the Prime Minister. That is now bringing together the fundamental tenets of a good early year in life into better opportunities. We'll continue to build on all of our work and continue to focus on the history of the past, but in order to make the future better. And to all of you in this chamber, I thank you for the commitment you give to Indigenous Australians. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice. Thank the Prime